Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second episode of the Hearthstone Inquirer, your one stop for Hearthstone news and rumors, community spotlight, and the deck of the week. My name is Strykov, and I'll be your host. This week in the news, our topics include top ranked player in the world, RDU, denied a seat at BlizzCon due to his country of origin. The play quarter is plagued with problems on release, preventing thousands of players from accessing the new content. Release of the Military Quarter in Hearthstone, and this week's Community Tournaments. Each year, Blizzard runs a convention called BlizzCon, which is a massive event featuring all of its various games, including tournaments with large cash prizes for the top-ranked players in the world. These players have fought their way to the top over the course of the year, beating dozens or even hundreds of opponents, all to get to the coveted seat of BlizzCon, where they can have their final showdown with the others that made it. Currently, RDU is one of the most well-known players in the Hearthstone community, having won several tournaments and placed in the top 5 and many more. He is also, as of this video, the number 1 ranked Hearthstone player in the world per Gosu Gamers. However, despite all of this, he cannot participate in the European BlizzCon qualifiers or obtain a seat at BlizzCon due to his country, Romania, being on Blizzard's blacklist. Now, when it comes to international law, especially in regards to gambling, this is a very complex and complicated topic. In many cases, a variety of gambling laws, new and old, prevent residents of these countries from participating in events such as BlizzCon as a result. Unfortunately, due to this and despite all of his achievements throughout the course of the year, it is unlikely that RDU will be able to participate in the qualifiers or the final event here in the USA. Thus far, Blizzard has been mute on the subject, but the major concern for many is that Due to international laws, the final event at BlizzCon won't be truly representative of the best Hearthstone players in the world. When the top 8 sit in those seats, we expect the very best. However, if the best are prevented from participating, then what will we truly see at the final event? Especially when, just this year, Bone7 from Cloud9 was able to participate in the international, where his team secured a 6th place spot, bringing in over $655,000 USD, and prize money for the team. This is a major problem that is currently holding back esports on a global scale and generally harms not only the sport but the players themselves. Unfortunately, without law reform in the affected countries, there is little to be done outside of special exceptions like with Bone 7 that generally requires a lot of legal finagling and special permissions granted by one or multiple governments. If esports as a sport is going to continue to grow, it's going to eventually need to find a way to work around these problems. Next up, problems with the play quarter plagued thousands of players this past week and ongoing issues after the release of the play quarter. Users found that their gold or money had been taken, but the play quarter hadn't unlocked for them. Or, when attempting to purchase a play quarter, the game would become locked at awaiting authorization and would prevent them from progressing past the screen. As of this video, the issue is still ongoing and Blizzard has been working feverishly behind the scenes to try and refund affected users that were overcharged and unlock content for those that were still gated from it. While the awaiting authorization and double charge issues have been hot fixed, the issue with the play quarter not unlocking after being successfully purchased does remain at this time. If you've been affected by any of these issues, it's recommended that you contact Blizzard support directly so they can assist you with resolving them accordingly. In other news, this week, the Military Quarter released. Luckily, the issues with unlocking the content from last week haven't reoccurred, and players in all three regions have been unlocking and playing the Military Quarter without issue. The cards you'll see this week include the neutral cards Dancing Swords, which is a 4-4 four four for 3 mana, which has a large drawback. Your opponent draws a card when it dies. The Spectral Knight, a 5 cost 4-6, which can't be targeted by hero powers or spell powers, is basically a larger fairy dragon, which has been a card many people have been looking forward to due to the prevalence of decks such as Miracle Rogue, Control Warrior, and Freeze Mage. Death Lord is a 3 cost 2 8 with Taunt, which places a card from your opponent's deck on the battlefield when it dies. This card has had much debate on whether it should be used in or against decks like Zoo, but right now the general consensus is that it's not as exciting as everyone originally thought. It'll be interesting in the coming week to see how this card pans out, however. Baron Ribbon there is the legendary release this week, 
and this card adds a very intriguing effect we haven't seen in Hearthstone before. With Nax Ramus being so focused on death rattles, this is the card that can potentially bring them all together. The Baron is a 4 cost 1 7 that causes minions with death rattles to trigger them twice. So this means there's all kinds of crazy and interesting combinations that one can achieve with this, such as triggering Sylvanas' death rattle twice to steal two minions, or getting two Nerubians from a single Nerubian egg. While the card itself doesn't have amazing stats, and is susceptible to silence, I think you'll see a lot of fun decks including the Baron in the coming weeks. The class cards for this week include Reincarnate for the Shaman, which will destroy a minion and return it to life at full health, and Void Color for the Warlock which will put a random demon from your hand onto the battlefield when it dies. Reincarnate is lackluster or very good depending on how you look at it. In one respect, you can get 12 damage out of a Leroy Jenkins in one turn for 6 mana. On the other hand, it's not nearly as exciting as other cards that have come out. Its uses are fairly obvious and while you can get creative with it, I just don't feel it's going to cause a large shift in gameplay style. As for Void Color, this may actually bring about the return of some of the lesser seen demons such as Felguard, Pit Lord, and perhaps even Lord Juraxas. The Felguard and Pit Lord have severe downsides in normal play, but great stats for their mana cost and Jaraxxus is generally considered too slow for this meta, but combine these with a Void Color and you have some real potential. While this isn't the most exciting week of Naxxramas, it definitely brings some new and exciting cards to the table which Hearthstone is in desperate need of. It'll be great to see what comes from all of these new combinations over the coming days and weeks. Lastly, this week's community tournaments which can potentially win you a seat in the Americas or European qualifier tournaments. Today, August 6th includes the Soulfire Wednesday Cup at 5 p.m. CDT, 6 p.m. EDT, and the National ESL Preseason Cup number 52, which starts at 5 p.m. PDT, 8 p.m. EDT. Saturday, August 9th brings us the Zotac Hearthstone NA Cup, which starts at 3 p.m. PDT, 6 p.m. EDT, the Zotac Hearthstone EU Cup, which starts at 1400 CEST, the Soulfire Saturday Cup, which starts at 2 p.m. CDT, 3 p.m. EDT, and the Top Deck EU Tournament, which begins at 1 p.m. UTC negative 4. And, for college students only, TESPA is hosting a Hearthstone Tournament, which begins at 12 p.m. PDT, 3 p.m. EDT. This tournament doesn't offer a seat in the qualifiers, but the Top 8 will be flown out to Nax Prime to compete on the stage for the grand prize. Sunday, August 10th, our final tournaments of the week are the National ESL Preseason Cup number 53, which begins at 3 p.m. PDT, 6 p.m. EDT, the TT Sports Summer Challenge Cup at 1600 CEST, and finally the Gosu Cup number 18, which starts at 1400 CEST. Links to all these tournaments can be found in the description below this video, so you can easily sign up if you're interested in participating. Many of these, such as ESL, are broadcast on Twitch.tv as well. Popular Hearthstone professional players, Reels and Amaz will also be commentating during the TESPA tournament broadcast this weekend, so keep an eye out for that. And now to wrap up the news for this week. Now let's move on and take a look at our Community Spotlight member for this week's episode. As esports continues to grow, one of the greatest challenges faced have been that of streaming live events. Syncing everything up over Twitch.tv and broadcasting events in a professional way has proved to be a challenging task thus far. However, thanks to the efforts of people like Meltcast, many of these problems have been rectified and the overall quality of tournaments and special events have greatly improved as a result. So, who is Meltcast? Meltcast originates from League of Legends where he was a caster for NESL. When they moved over to Hearthstone and started producing content here, Meltcast was asked if he wished to take on the challenge. He accepted. At that time, the problems prevalent in online casting were ongoing in the Hearthstone community, with very few people having figured out how to surpass the many hurdles which presented themselves when running such an event. Melcast took it upon himself to resolve these issues within the community until, after several months of hard and mostly thankless work, he was finally noticed by some tournament organizers who wanted someone experienced in this regard to help with their own productions. The first major break for Melcast was Reynad's Lord of the Arena, 
which towered a viewer base of over 70,000 strong. After that, Melcast branched out to events such as Deck Wars, WEC, and so on. These events typically start between 1.30 a.m. and 3 a.m. in Melcast's local time zone and run all night, which means he's up the entirety of the night, making sure everything behind the scenes is running like a well-oiled machine for the thousands of Hearthstone fans that tune in each week. There are many members in the Hearthstone community that contribute in a big way, but it's individuals like Melcast that have helped to push the quality of our broadcast and events to the next level. Typical broadcasting networks have dozens of staff members and millions of dollars to put on a quality production, but in the world of Twitch broadcasting, there's typically only a handful of people and little to no money involved. What Melcast and others have done for the community isn't something we should take for granted. You'll often find him hanging out in the chat during the various tournaments each week, so if you see him, be sure to say hi and know that he's always slaving away behind the scenes for the betterment of the community. And now, onto our deck of the week. Recently, thanks to the efforts of professional players such as Kalento, the Paladin has made a massive comeback in the competitive scene. Today, we're taking a look at a deck that is by a user named Taylor from Hearthpone.com. You'll find the link to the deck in the description below this video. This is a control paladin deck with a twist. It's based around the paladin weapons and capitalizes on the synergy between them and Captain Greenskin, which is a card you never really see getting played. The Sword of Justice is one of the key cards in this deck. Not only can it buff the tokens from your hero power to two twos, but it can buff any other minion you play on the board. Combine Captain Greenskin with this and you can potentially have a two attack Sword of Justice with an extra charge. As a nice bonus, the Captain Greenskin will become a 6-5, which greatly increases his survivability and basically makes him a fire elemental. Buffing your other minions such as your Acolyte of Pain, Harvest Golem, and of course your Azura Drakes can all help greatly increase their survivability as well. When going up against a mage, having a 5-5 Azura Drake in the board could ruin their Flame Strike, for example. One of the biggest weaknesses of the True Silver Champion is that it can only do 4 damage meaning it's weak against cards with 5 health. With Captain Greenskin, you can make this a 5 attack weapon with 3 charges. Or, for maximum damage, take the Ashbringer from Tyrion Fordring and make it a 6 attack weapon with 4 charges. If your opponent doesn't have an Ooze or a Harrison Jones, they're going to be having a bad time after that. Now, there are 2 secrets in this deck, one of which we don't usually see. These are Noble Sacrifice and Repentance. Noble Sacrifice will summon a 2-1 minion to take a hit whenever an enemy attacks, and Repentance will change any minion that's played to 1 HP. You don't often see Repentance played because you can't really account for what your opponent is going to drop on the board. The dream, obviously, is to have something like a Mountain Giant get dropped while you have a Repentance in use, so it's immediately reduced to 1 HP. However, more often than not, your opponent will be smart enough to drop a lower health minion first, that will make the secret inconsequential. In slower matchups, however, I actually do really like the secret and it fits well within the deck. However, with that being said, as with any deck, feel free to customize it to your own personal playstyle and what works best against the type of decks you're up against. Aside from the weapon synergy, it plays like a fairly standard paladin control deck. Your aim is to keep your opponent's board clear while continuing to keep yours filled. Since Paladins have a limited amount of damage, your aim should be to try to create a token every turn so that you don't run out of damage. Expect to take games into fatigue against Freeze Mage and Control Warrior with this deck, so plan accordingly. All in all, this is a fun deck and it's nice to see someone doing something a little bit different from everyone else. Taylor actually used this deck to get to Legend last season, and I feel that it's just as viable now as it was then especially with a new Paladin Secret on the horizon. So, whether you're looking for a fun but challenging deck to play in casual, or something to work your way up the ladder with, give this deck a spin. And that concludes Episode 2 of the Hearthstone Inquirer. If you liked the video, please let me know by clicking the like button below. Otherwise, if you disliked it, please click the dislike button and let me know why in the comments section. Your feedback is always appreciated. Also, should you have any nominations for the Community Spotlight or Deck of the Week sections, please let me know and I'll take them into consideration for the next episode. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. This is Striketh, checking out.